Afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't have anything off the top, so happy to go to your questions. Lita. Hi, Peter. I'm wondering if you can clear up some things um, about uh, Nani's and, and his, his reported death. Can you say at this point whether or not um, the Pentagon is more certain that um, the airstrike killed him and any details about that? And also, could you address um, the latest uh, claims by Russia that its airstrike, uh, Russia, uh, Russian airstrike in Aleppo province um, killed 40 militants, including him. Can you help us clear up the confusion here? Let me, let me try my best. Okay. Um, first off, let me just say off the top that Adnani's removal from the battlefield, as we said yesterday, would be a very good thing. This is someone who has been a senior leader in ISIL. He's been responsible for ISIL's external plotting, been directly responsible for recruiting foreign fighters, uh, also been responsible for encouraging attacks against the West, against civilians and military personnel in the West. Uh, he's been their chief spokesman, as you know, the mouthpiece for ISIL. So again, his elimination uh, would be a significant blow to ISIL, a uh, significant blow to ISIL's leadership, and importantly, uh, a significant step in reducing uh, ISIL's ability to conduct external attacks outside of Iraq and Syria. We have actively been looking for Adnani for some time, given his prominent role within the organization. And I'm not going to get into intelligence or operational matters, uh, but we have already confirmed for you all that we conducted a precision strike yesterday targeting Adnani uh, near Al Bab, Syria. Uh, and we are still assessing the results of that strike. Now, with regard to the, the Russians, uh, we have no information to support Russia's claim that they also carried out a strike against uh, Adnani. And I would just note uh, that from the start, Russia, uh, as you know, has spent most of its time, its military campaign, supporting and propping up the Assad regime. Uh, it has not devoted much, if any, effort uh, that we're aware of, targeting ISIL's leadership. Uh, and at the same time, we've not seen the Russian military campaign uh, use precision weaponry uh, on a regular basis as well. Uh, if that's changing, that would be a, a good thing. Uh, but again, we have no information at this time to support the claim that, that they also conducted a strike uh, in this way. But the, you are certain, the U.S. is certain that Adnani was um, in the vehicle that the U.S. targeted, is that? Uh, I'm not going to We have a rigorous process, Lita, as you know, um, that we follow here. We're going to follow that process. Uh, I know what ISIL itself has said. I know what the Russians have said. Um, we don't trust. We're not going to be satisfied simply to trust ISIL and the Russians on this. We're going to go through our process. Do you know if uh, Russia was conducting airstrikes in the same area? Because they're saying, sort of a, a different kind of region, Aleppo province, small town, versus Al-Bab. Do you have any sense of whether Russia was, and the U.S. were conducting strikes in the same area? I can just tell you what I said before. We have no information to support uh, Russia's claim that it carried out a strike against Adnani. Thank you. Yes, it is. Uh, just to follow up, uh, when the U.S. did take the airstrike, did it let the Russians or the Syrians know to clear the airspace? Um, I, I'm not going to get into operational details for this. This is a strike, uh, again, a precision strike that we carried out um, after extensive uh, review and a very deliberate process. And uh, so we, we conducted this strike as we have other strikes against high-value targets. There is a communication of channel between the Russians and the Americans. So was that ever used when this, or has the, was it used when this strike took place or before? Uh, I'm not aware that it was. Uh, I can't say for certain. I haven't asked that question. If I could uh, quickly ask about Turkey and YPG. Um, in the past 24 hours, have you seen any hostilities between the two sides? Um, in the last 24 hours, my understanding is we have continued to see a, a calm in northern Syria, um, which we think is a, is a good thing. Um, and again, we continue to work uh, very closely with our coalition uh, partner and ally, uh, Turkey in trying to address uh, their concerns about the situation. Likewise, we continue to work uh, with our partners in Syria uh, to try and keep the focus 
where it should be, and that is on the common enemy we all share, and that's ISIL. Yes, and the Pentagon said they were s establishing a communication channel for deconfliction. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what that communication channel is, and, and how is it different from what you have already? Uh, I'm not actually going to get into the details of, of how that is being conducted, but I think as you got a sense from General Votel, uh, we are in constant communication with uh, our partners, uh, with our coalition uh, members, and uh, in this particular instance, we're using uh, that communication, the various lines of communication we have to try and address the situation, address the, the concerns that, uh, that uh, uh, again, some of our partners and allies have. So I'm trying to figure out, is this a new communication that you're opening, or is this part of the communications you already have? I think it's fair to say, and I think you got a sense of this from General Votel, that we have uh, stepped up our efforts to make sure that we are addressing the concerns of uh, our partners and members of the coalition um, and that is uh, above and beyond what we've been doing previously, given the sensitivity of this situation and the importance, once again, of keeping everyone focused on what matters most, and that is uh, keeping the pressure on ISIL uh, on as many fronts as possible, and that's what we're doing. Is this a part of CJTF OIR, or is this sort of unilateral between the Turks and the Kurds and you? I, I, I think, again, I, I just sort of echo what General Votel said. This is in conjunction with the, the coalition effort uh, in Syria. Yes, Jim. Hi, Peter. Uh, just briefly back on, on the Russia claim, uh, defense official described it to me as laughable. Are you calling Russian claim to have taken out Adnani false? Uh, I'm just telling you, Jim, that we don't have any information to support uh, what the Russians have put forward. On Turkey, uh, you, you had these odd conditions where you had U.S.-backed forces on opposite sides of the battlefield for a time. Uh, beyond the kind of short-term ceasefire, if you want to call it that, what, what's the long-term plan to clear up the confusion on the battlefield, particularly as, as, as Turkey, uh, with regard to Turkey's role? Well, Jim, we're going to continue to work with, uh, with our ally and coalition partner, Turkey. Um, uh, General Votel addressed this yesterday. This is, a, this is a partner we work with closely on a whole range of fronts, including specifically in the, the counter-ISIL fight. And this is an important area to the coalition effort, this border area. And we're going to continue to work with Turkey and try and address their concerns, uh, their legitimate concerns about what's happening along the border. Um, at the same time, keep the focus on ISIL and not be distracted at this, this really important moment in the campaign. And that's we want to keep everyone as laser focused on ISIL at this moment as we can. And I think General Votel and uh, our other commanders who are talking to those coalition partners uh, on a regular basis, a daily basis, uh, are, are doing that, and we're hopeful they're going to continue to make progress to keep that focus on ISIL. Have the Turks communicated to you that keeping the Kurds to the east of the Euphrates is sufficient to keep them happy? Uh, we will continue to Turk, uh, talk to the, the Turks. I'll leave the uh, Turkish government to speak for itself, but we've, that's a commitment that uh, the SDF forces have made, uh, and we believe it's a commitment they're on. Finally, I wonder how you would characterize the relationship. I know that you're talking to each other and your NATO allies, as we know, but there have been a lot of public spats between the U.S. Uh, and Turkey, you know, regarding the coup, but the status of Incirlik, et cetera, uh, and, and leading up to now this, uh, this latest disagreement. Well, what's the state of the U.S.-Turkish military relationship right now? This is a, a, a stalwart ally of, of NATO, a NATO ally. This is a coalition uh, member. This is a, uh, a country and a military that we've had uh, decades of collaboration with. And, uh, uh, Jim, there is a lot of uh, uh, residual history here, good history between the United States and Turkey, between our military, this building, uh, and the Turkish uh, military. And we are obviously um, trying to, to make sure that those bonds, those ties, uh, continue here as strong as they've been in the past. And there's some challenges with these sensitivities. We understand that. We're working closely with uh, Turkey trying to address those concerns. Um, but they are a vital, vital member of NATO, of course, and a vital member of the, of the coalition against ISIL. And their help and support for that has been critically important. And that's why we're working so closely with Turkey to make sure we can address these concerns and keep the focus on ISIL, which uh, again, is the common enemy we all share, and we are at a, a moment right now where applying that pressure, not just in Syria, not just along the border area there, but in Iraq and elsewhere, uh, Libya, 
Afghanistan, critically important. Carla. Oh, thank you, Peter. Going back to El Adnani, was that an unmanned or manned strike? And um, in addition, can you say, in addition to the driver and El Adnani, who else was in the vehicle? Uh, Carla, I'm not going to get into uh, operational details about this strike. We're continuing our review, um, going through the, our normal process, and uh, again, this was a precision strike that we carried out, but I'm not going to get into more details. Yes, Thomas. Peter, back on uh, Adnani. Um, you know, there was a kind of a timeline discrepancy. Uh, the Islamic State came out and said that Adnani had been killed, and then the Pentagon came out with a statement and said that it had targeted a senior leader and then refined that as the night went on. Um, was the intended target of this strike throughout its entire process, obviously it's a deliberate strike, it's at precision, intelligence went into it, was the intended target of this strike at not? Uh, I'm not going to get into that. every, uh, all the operational intelligence details going in. We targeted, conducted a precision strike against uh, Adnani. Um, that was uh, our intended target. And again, we're going through the process right now of trying to, to determine um, if this strike was as successful as we hope it was. And yes. Uh, Sorry. Just, Go ahead. Yeah, just a, a follow up. You know, the, you have this friction between the Russians claiming they struck him 16 miles to the west of mm -hmm. Bob, which is a uh, Kurdish front line. Uh, you know, and kind of, I know you weren't really answering any questions about if there was any uh, Russian evidence of a strike. But as far as, you know, you said we have a coordination cell that deconflicts airspace, does the U.S. have any evidence that there was Russian aircraft in that area around the same time that we were? Because obviously if they said they struck at the same time in the same place or around it, we would have to deconflict airspace. Yeah. Um, you know, my I'm not going to speak for the, the Russian Ministry of Defense and their air activities. I can just tell you what I said before, Thomas, and that is, we have no information uh, to support uh, the Russian claim that they carried out a strike against Adnani. What, what do you mean when you say no information? I mean, there is no evidence that there was any Russian activity in that area at all. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm not going to get into intelligence matters. Uh, I think you can appreciate that. I, that's uh, as far as I can go. Goyal. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Peter, uh, this was a great week between uh, U.S. and India. Uh, military to military relationships are concerned, a major defense partnership, among others. And you have seen the press conference with the defense minister and secretary. Uh, my question is that at least uh, the neighbors of India, two neighbors, in China and Pakistan, are not happy with this uh, special relationship, military to military, between U.S. and India, and also the partnership uh, what was uh, agreed and uh, signed and all these agreements. So what uh, understanding and where do we go from here because if they are not happy or they don't support and they are against the uh, agreements between or the relations between the two countries? Well, I think I'll just echo what the Secretary said here with, uh, uh, with his counterpart, with Minister Parikar, and this is a, this is a relationship that, uh, that has certainly has grown. Um, it is a relationship that we believe enhances the uh, security both of the United States and of India and of the region um, and uh, and there should be no reason for others to be concerned about that relationship it it, it adds to security in the region and we we see this as an opportunity to to strengthen our ties with India our defense ties but that those enhanced relations those that enhanced coordination uh, represents a, 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 a security enhancement for the for the region as a whole uh, and uh, again these are these are positive steps that we're taking with uh, with another country that uh, shares our values and uh, and uh, in many respects, again, uh, this represents an opportunity to enhance an already strong relationship. And finally, how long do you think it will take to implement all these agreements? And also, when uh, now Prime Minister Modi and President Obama will be in China for the G20, you think all these issues will be discussed there? Um, I'll leave it to the White House and. Uh, and the Prime Minister's office to discuss their uh, plans for the G20. And uh, I would echo what Minister Parikar said about uh, the logistics agreement took some, uh, some time to finally uh, be realized. And uh, I'm not going to put a calendar or a deadline on, on these other agreements. Thank but uh, obviously, we look forward to working uh, closely with uh, our Indian counterparts to try and, and, uh, and move this relationship forward. 
Yes, Ali. Uh, I wanted to ask you on the logistic agreement which was signed early this week. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the significance of this agreement? Is it a routine agreement or is there something unique between India and US which helped you to sign this logistic agreement? Now, how is this going to benefit the US? Well, I, I, you heard uh, both the, the Secretary and the Minister uh, discuss the, the agreement, but this is, uh, this is an agreement that is consistent with, uh, with logistics agreements that we have with literally about 100 other countries. Uh, so it, it, I don't want to call it routine, but it is something, there is a sort of formal template that, that we have done this with, with many other countries. And the, the upside for both countries is uh, this is a logistics agreement that allows us, when we conduct operations, for example, to be able to uh, uh, engage in refueling of a ship much more easily than, than is possible now. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a, an agreement that uh, is a mutual agreement. It allows uh, determinations to be made on a case-by-case -case basis whether uh, each country will be able to reciprocate with, with uh, logistical support. But uh, we just think it will make the, the conduct of our operations uh, with uh, the Indian military that much more efficient. Uh, and effective, and again, it's very consistent with uh, agreements we have with other countries. Just wanted to quickly ask you a follow-up on what uh, Goel said. I would like to draw your attention to the editorial in Global Times, the Chinese official media, in which they have expressed concerns about this logistic agreement, and they have said this is not going to help India's uh, help address India's security needs. Now you are saying that this will add to security of the region. How do you see the Chinese uh, statements coming there? Well, um, again, I, I would speak to the positive nature about this uh, agreement, which is, again, to enhance the uh, security relationship between uh, uh, our two countries and, uh, we think, enhance the uh, security in the region. This is a, a country that shares our values. Should not be uh, this agreement and our relationship with India should not be a cause for concern for, for others. This is an important relationship with uh, an important uh, uh, country in the world, and one that uh, the Secretary, uh, I think, feels very confident that uh, uh, will grow in the future and have even more benefits, uh, benefits both for the United States and for India and for the region as a whole. Finally, the CNN said something this week after the meeting that uh, Secretary Carter's new BFA best friend forever is Mr. Minister Parikar. Do you agree with the CNN's view? Um, I would <laughs> agree that <laughs> Minister Parikar and the Secretary have an excellent uh, relationship. And uh, I know the Secretary very much uh, enjoys his engagements with uh, Minister Parikar. Uh, they have an excellent working relationship. It is a very businesslike relationship. Uh, and I think we've seen uh, through their uh, engagements over the past uh, year more uh, the, the benefits of that, uh, that close relationship. We're seeing tangible results, and I think uh, part of that is a, it's just an indication of the strong working relationship they have. Thank you. Christina. Thanks. Um, at this point, can you rule out that Russia was responsible for the Ednami strike? Uh, Christina, I can just tell you uh, again that we conducted a precision strike targeting Ednani, uh, and we don't have any information uh, at this point to support uh, Russia's claims that they carried out a strike. And I, that's, that's what I can share with you at this moment. And we're still assessing the results of our strike. And why do you think Russia is claiming responsibility? Uh, you have to ask the Russians that. And not the actual reason for which I would probably ask the Russians, but why does this department think the Russians are claiming responsibility for this? Uh, I, I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak to. I'm going to speak to what 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 we've done, uh, and what we've engaged in. And uh, as you know, precision strikes against ISIL leaders is something uh, the coalition has been very focused on, very successful at over the last uh, few months. Uh, it, this has been a key part of our campaign. Uh, and again, we've been very successful at it. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wager a, a, a guess as to why they might have a motive to, to engage in this and to discuss this. And maybe it's a, just a misunderstanding on their part. But we're going to continue to target um, ISIL leaders as we have, because we think it has taken a toll on the organization as a whole. It's an in, uh, important means by which we can weaken ISIL, and we're going to continue to do that. Yes? Yes. Uh, one is a follow-up and another a question. The follow-up is that on this, uh, India has been long, you know, you remember the, it was a non-aligned movement. 
and then it was uh, in 70s uh, with the Russians. So do you think that this agreement brings it to the U.S. fold, or you think it's just another country to that 100-plus addition? Well, this is an important relationship between the United States and India. It's something that builds on uh, our existing defense relationship, and it's, uh, it's a basis on which we uh, can conduct operations uh, in an important part of the world. Um, and I think we should look at it in, in that light. This is another step forward for the U.S.-India defense relationship, and I know the Secretary is optimistic that there can be additional steps uh, in the future. Um, there are many uh, mutual uh, security concerns that we in India have, and this is an opportunity to try and address some of those concerns, at the same time address regional concerns uh, that, uh, that both countries share and, again, could play a role in, in uh, reducing tensions and, and addressing some of those concerns on a broader basis. And, uh, the other question is that I had asked you actually earlier, and that time you had referred me to the Indian government. The Indian Minister of State, M.J. Akbar, mm -hmm. was in Syria, and now uh, Indian Defense Minister Parikar was here. So was there this subject discussed? Was there, did Mr. Parikar uh, give a readout of uh, that meeting to Secretary Khan, because, uh, you know, just saying that, no, it never came up, uh, I don't know how much many of us will believe, but, you know, he was... I'm not aware that it came up. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, that's... Carla, I'm sorry, you've, you already had a question. I'll come back if I can. Thomas. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, just going back to what you were talking about earlier about the calm in northern Syria that you've mm -hmm. seen in recent hours, days. Um, would you say this is more indicative of a, of, a, of a truce, or is it more a reflection of the fact that the two forces perhaps haven't been in the so same location? Because Turkey today have been quite vehement in denying that there's any kind of agreement brokered. Um, yesterday, Colonel, Colonel Thomas said there'd been a loose agreement reached between all sides in, in this conflict. So just perhaps could you give us some clarity about um, what the status is of the forces there and what the communication channels are between them? Yeah, I, I, Thomas, it is a reflection of what we see on the ground right now. Uh, and again, we think that calm is a, is a good thing, uh, and we hope it gives uh, everyone the opportunity to, to focus again on the, on the central issue, and that is ISIL. Uh, and uh, so I, it reflects what we see on, on the ground right now. Yeah, but the calm... Um when you say the calm is a good thing, like what has precipitated the calm? Is it is it an agreement, or is it is it enhanced communications, or is it just the fact that they're not in the same place anymore? Well, certainly there have been, as you heard from General Votel, communications urging uh, all the um, uh, both Turkey uh, and uh, uh, our local partners on the ground uh, to try and address uh, ease some of the the concerns and tensions and the the clashes that we saw over the weekend. And uh, so we're hopeful, I think General Votel expressed this, that those communications have uh, tried to, to ease those tensions and, uh, and again, get the focus back on, on ISIL. Uh, I'll leave it to the Turkish government to, to characterize it uh, and from, from their perspective, but we think uh, there's an opportunity for everyone to stay focused on ISIL and to, uh, and the more we do that, uh, the better for everyone, and the sooner we uh, accelerate the lasting defeat of ISIL, which is what we all want. But you're not calling this an agreement. This is just, you're not saying this is an agreement or, or a truce of any type. Uh, I'm just, this is a, what's happening on the ground is a, a, a relative calm. It is, uh, we're not seeing the clashes we saw from uh, this weekend, and uh, we think that's a good thing. Yes, Kasim. I will um, address to this communication channel back. Mm -hmm. uh, there are reports that the United States has transferred or relocated their special forces in between the fronts of Turkish fronts and PYD fronts. Could you could you confirm or deny this? You, you know, I'm not going to describe the location of our uh, special forces. From from this podium, you have many times you have said, and also U.S. other U.S. spokespersons mm -hmm. have expressed that. The YPG is in a supported role in, our, in, our, in and around Membej, and then they will move back when the Membej operation is completed. And then even last week, you have announced that 
some of the forces in Mambij and in around Mambij have been started have started to move back to the east of your places. But Turkey is saying that none of the military, you know, uh, military elements of YPG have moved from Mambij and to the east of the Euphrates. Even PYD has also said itself that it's going to reinforce its forces in and around Mambij to challenge the Turkish and Free Syrian army move. Could you comment on this, you know, because this, these facts are contradicting what you have been saying from the beginning? I can tell you again that we, um, from what we're seeing on the ground, that uh, uh, the SDF has honored its uh, commitments to move back east of the Euphrates. As you know as well, we've been talking about uh, there are pockets of resistance in Manbij. There's still clearing operations in Manbij. There's still IEDs that need to be dealt with. And there are some SDF forces, and my understanding is there are forces that are local to that area um, who are there doing some of those operations, still conducting those operations. But, but, but the SDF forces in the, in the main have moved uh, east of the Euphrates, and we believe they're honoring that commitment. Does it include the YPG itself as well? As you that's, said, that's my understanding. Um, well, the, the, some of the YPG posts have been taken over by the Free Syrian Army, and in these posts, uh, some documents that showing the connection between YPG and PKK have been recovered. Also, some ammunitions have been recovered from there, which are claimed to be those of the American ammunitions that have been provided for the fight against ISIS. Uh, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of those reports, and. Uh, uh, Again, we believe the, the SDF has honored the commitments made to us, and you know um, about our support for local partner forces on the, on the ground, and that that's been uh, something we've talked about at length. Um, and, uh, and again, we, this, is a, this is a situation that um, is complicated, and it's, this is a situation where we've uh, spoken directly with Turkey about what's going on. We've also spoken directly with our uh, local partners on the ground, trying to express uh, our views and our concerns about uh, their activities and making sure that everyone stays focused on the central target here, and that should be ISIL. And we, again, can, will continue to, to encourage uh, all the coalition uh, members and partners to keep that focus. From from the very beginning, you have been saying that you are providing ammunition to the Syrian Arab coalition. To yes. what extent you are sure that some of these ammunition are not somehow transferred to PYD and YPG, even PKK? We have no indication that that's happened. This is, uh, as you know, we've uh, continued to supply uh, ammunition to those groups. This is a transaction. We carefully monitor where that uh, ammunition goes. Uh, and uh, again, if people are not abiding by uh, the agreements they've reached with us, then they're not going to get uh, our equipment, and that's something we've made clear from the start, and uh, that's something we'll continue to, to uh, push and uh, and demand of our of our partners on the ground. And, and my last question, sorry, I'm okay. late. <laughs> uh, uh, there are some other some other reports that during an, an, an offense on the Turkish and uh, some other Free Syrian Army forces by ISIL, that uh, the Turkish and um, the Free Syrian Army Forces called for an air, air uh, support, but the coalition declined to provide the air support because they thought maybe some PYD or YPG forces are included or involved in the conflict. I, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of that instance. So I've got time for one more. Honestly, I have to be somewhere at 1.15. So, yes, Jenny. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, recently, uh, North Korean uh, leader Kim Jong-un said that uh, North Korea used uh, nuclear preemptive anti attack to the United States. And um, <clears throat> reason, any uh, contingency reason that the U.S. have planned to use nuclear attack to North Korea? I'm sorry, say that last bit again. Nuclear attack to North Korea, U.S., United States have, would use nuclear. Uh, Jenny, you know, you know I'm not going to talk about uh, strategic issues like that here. This is uh, the provocative language we've heard from the North Koreans is something we've heard repeatedly from them. Uh, and it does nothing to enhance security uh, in that part of the world on the Korean Peninsula. And it only raises tensions and does uh, 
again, this is something that remains a concern to us. There's a reason we uh, will continue to, to stand by our ally, South Korea, and continue to take all the steps that we are taking uh, to ensure uh, the security not only of our South Korean allies, but the United States as well. And we will continue to maintain that posture. And President Obama mentioned about NFU, uh, no first to use it of uh, nuclear. So this is a misconcept in the message to uh, Kim Jong Un. So. I think uh, the message to Kim Jong-un should be clear about the United States' resolve with regard to not only our own defense, but the defense of our South Korean allies, our other allies uh, in the region. And uh, again, the provocative language we've gotten received from the North Koreans, the provocative actions from the North Koreans uh, are not doing anything to ease tensions in that part of the world. And uh, we'd like to see steps taken to lower the temperature. And we're not seeing that right now with the North Koreans. So as a result, we're going to do what we need to do to make sure that the United States uh, again, remains uh, uh, protected from the threat of North Korea and that our allies in the region do as well. Thanks, everybody. I'm sorry I got to run.